Situated in present-day Jordan and hidden amidst nearly impenetrable mountains to the east of the valley connecting the Gulf of Aqaba and the Dead Sea, stands the ancient city of Petra. Petra is a treasure from antiquity, hidden behind a barrier of rugged mountains, boasting incomparable scenes that make it one of the most majestic and imposing ancient sites still standing. The rock-carved rose-red city of Petra is full of mysterious charm. The first major monument that one comes to when entering Petra is the obelisk tomb and Bab Asik Triclinium. The most intriguing part of this structure is its interesting mixture of Egyptian, Greek, and Abation style architecture. Actually, it is two separate monuments stacked on top of each other. A modern gravel road, with one side for horses and the other for pedestrians, runs alongside the Wadi Musa, which is dry most of the year, but flows with water in the winter. Unlike the famous rose-red hue of the rest of Petra, the Bab Asik is mostly white rock with subtle earth tones of browns and beiges. The Sikh, which means the shaft, is a dark, narrow gorge that was carved not by human hands, but by tectonic forces during a long-ago earthquake. Ranging from 50 meters wide to only about 5, the Sikh follows a meandering 1.25-kilometer path, bounded by walls about 100 meters tall. The entrance to the Sikh was originally marked by an ornamental arch. It collapsed in 1896, but its decorated abutments have survived. The Sikh is not technically a gorge, as it was formed not by erosion, but tectonic forces, which caused the rock to split dramatically in half. It was only then that the waters of the Wadi Musa flowed in, and the winds blew through the newly formed gap, gradually rounding the sharp edges into smooth curves. Petra is without doubt Jordan's most valuable treasure and greatest tourist attraction. It is a vast, unique city, carved into the sheer rock face by the Nabatians, an industrious Arab people who settled here more than 2,000 years ago, turning it into an important junction for the silk, spice, and other trade routes that link China, India, and Southern Arabia with Egypt, Syria, Greece, and Rome. Along the way are some small niches, shrines and carvings that merit investigation, and running along the length of the Sikh are water channels carved by the Nabatians to provide water to the city of Petra. Anticipation builds as the walk continues, and the end of the Sikh is a dramatic moment, planned that way by the Nabatians to impress their visitors. Here, protected from invasion by nature's unyielding ramparts, a culture grew from a small group of hunter-gatherers into a sophisticated city of about 20,000 inhabitants. Over the years, they learned to harvest water from the site's natural springs, the winter snowfall, and summer showers. They built aqueducts through the mountain in order to carry more water from distant springs. The gorge narrows, and the soft curves of the Sikh frame a sunlit strip of an extraordinary site, the Treasury, or al -Kazne. It is an awe-inspiring experience. A massive facade, 30 meters wide and 43 meters high, carved out of the sheer, dusky pink rock face and dwarfing everything around it. 
It was carved in the early first century as the tomb of an important Abbasian king and represents the engineering genius of these ancient people. The complete name of the monument in Arabic is Kaznet Faroun, or Treasury of the Pharaoh. Popular myth claims that the pharaoh who drove Moses out of Egypt stored his wealth in the Kazne, specifically in the urn that sits at the top of the building. The purpose of the treasury remains something of a mystery. One thing that is fairly certain, however, is that it was not a treasury. In reality, the treasury is generally believed to be a temple or a royal tomb, though neither conclusion is certain. Petra's magnificent temples and tombs are like no other religious buildings in the world, and the surrounding rugged landscape dotted with historical sites is a hiker's paradise. Petra has been a city of great religious significance since ancient times. First, it has a number of connections with the Old Testament. The nearby Ain Musa, Spring of Moses, is believed to be where the prophet Moses struck a rock with his staff to extract water. An Aaron is said to have died in the Petra area and been buried atop Jaba Harun, Mount Aaron. Later, the Nabatians built a city packed with tombs, temples, sanctuaries, and altars to their gods. Finally, in its final years, Petra was the home of at least one Byzantine church. This dramatic history and Petra's fascinating sites all modern visitors, up to 3,000 of whom visit the site every day. One thing that is certain is that the Treasury Monument was built to impress. It is located in such a way that it grabs the attention of every visitor that enters the city and excites everyone who glimpses it for the first time. The central figure on the upper level of Tholos may be the fertility goddess of Petra, El Uza. In the Greco-Roman world, as well as in the Parthian East, people have always accorded the gods a human form. The Nabatians, on the other hand, represented their gods in the form of stele. These stele could take the form of rocks set upon end, blocks or shapes carved into a stone wall, or elaborately carved square gin blocks set up at the entrance to their cities. The water and the protection guaranteed by the Petra Mountains attracted passing caravans in need of a place to rest and restock. Inside, a colossal doorway dominates the outer court and leads to an inner chamber of 12 square meters. At the back of the chamber is a sanctuary with an ablution basin suggesting that the treasury was a temple or some other kind of holy place. After viewing the treasury, visitors come next to the Street of Facades, which is lined with tall, impressive tombs, with large facades or false faces on their fronts. The Nabatians were influenced by the Assyrians, as can be seen in the several tomb facades that still display crow-step battlements near the top of the facade. The name Petra, which means rock in Greek and Latin, derived from the word Petre, is actually a modern name for the place. This is because the city was carved from the friable sandstone cliffs of the area. The rocks take on a multitude of hues, ranging from cream to orange to red and dark brown. Layers of these rocks form whorls of colors which were incorporated into the Nabatian architecture.
Today, some of the intricate facades sculpted into the sandstone cliffs of the area can still be seen, along with other remarkably preserved structures and monuments left behind by this fascinating civilization. This monument was actually carved from the rock and cliff face by the Nabatians in the early 1st century AD, and only later modified by the Romans, shortly after their annexation of the kingdom. Petra's theater was built in the 1st century AD. It is quite large, with a seating capacity of over 6,000 people. The theater's 45 rows of seats are divided horizontally by two dios amara. Its cavea faces north and east to keep the sun out of the spectator's eyes. Above the cavea are numerous tomb fronts that were destroyed to make way for the theater's upper tiers of seating, indicating how keen the people of Petra were to have a theater. It is not known when exactly Petra was built, but evidence suggests that settlements had begun in and around Petra during the 18th dynasty of Egypt, between 1550 and 1292 BCE, and it is mentioned in the Bible as the cleft in the rock. The city began to prosper as the capital of the Nabatian Empire from the first century BC, and grew rich through trade in frankincense and myrrh, along with spices from Yemen. During this period, it assumed the aspect of a Hellenistic city. In 106 CE, when Cornelius Palma was governor of Syria, that part of Arabia under the rule of Petra was absorbed into the Roman Empire as part of Arabia Petrae, of which Petra became the capital. The native dynasty came to an end, but the city continued to flourish. A century later, in the time of Alexander Severus, when the city was at the height of its splendor, the issue of coinage came to an end. There was no more building of sumptuous tombs, owing apparently to some sudden catastrophe, such as an invasion by a Neo-Persian power under the Sassanid Empire. Meanwhile, as Palmyra grew in importance and attracted the Arabian trade away from Petra, the latter declined. It seems, however, to have lingered as a religious center. A large earthquake in 363 AD destroyed much of the city. Many buildings were never rebuilt after this, although not long after the event Petra was designated the seat of a Byzantine bishopric. However, the earthquake combined with changes in trade routes eventually led to the decline of the city, which was ultimately abandoned. By the middle of the 7th century Petra appears to have been largely deserted, and it was then forgotten by all except local Bedouin. In 1812, a Swiss explorer named Johannes Burckhardt set out to rediscover Petra. He dressed up as an Arab and convinced his Bedouin guide to take him to the lost city. After this, Petra became increasingly known in the West as a fascinating and beautiful ancient city, and it began attracting visitors, as it continues to do to this day. Petra is also known as the Rose Red City, a name it gets from the marvelous color of the rock from which many of the city's structures were carved. In addition to the magnificent remains of the Nabatian city, humans have settled and used the land around Petra for over 10,000 years, making it a place where great natural, cultural, archaeological, and geological features merge. The main steps to the high place of sacrifice start just before the amphitheater. The high place is called thus because it is located at the very top of a mountain. The only way to reach the high place is on foot, and visitors must climb some 800 steps to reach the top.
Located below the high place of sacrifice on a level area are two obelisks about seven meters tall. They are cut from the bedrock and stand 30 meters apart on a perfect east-west alignment. The function of these obelisks is not known, although they are thought to represent the two main male and female Nabation deities, Dushara and Auza. The Lion Fountain is located in close proximity to the Garden Temple, indicating that it was also part of the Nabation water system in this area. The fountain is carved into the rock face, and the flow of water was channeled in such a way that it poured out through the lion's mouth into the basin below, providing refreshment for worshippers en route to the High Place of Sacrifice. Located in Wadi Faraz, adjacent to the Roman soldier tomb, the Garden Temple's function is as yet uncertain. Very likely it did not function as a tomb since there are no burial niches or triclinium. The Roman soldier tomb gets its name from the carved figure of a Roman soldier in one of the three niches in the tomb's facade. In fact, the card figure is the only Roman quality of the tomb. The architecture and style of the monument is not Roman and can be dated to the first half of the first century AD. This microcosm of human history takes the visitor on a trip through time, as far back as 10,000 years. Visitors will be dazzled not only by the historical grandeur, but also by the natural beauty created by the effects of the sun, wind, and weather on the site's colorful stone. What is even more incredible is that excavations continue in the area, and it is believed that most of Petra still lies beneath the sand. Named for its features reminiscent of Italian Renaissance architecture, the Renaissance tomb has a beautiful arched doorway that is topped with three urns. The tomb's facade is so similar to that of the Sextius Florentinus tomb that it is believed they were carved at the same time, in the 2nd century AD. The colonnaded street runs through the center of Petra, with many unexcavated sites on either side. This Roman paved road was the main street running through an important commercial section of the city, and today the remains of these buildings can be seen on either side of the street. The visible stretch of the colonnaded street extends from the Nifium to the Temenos Gate. This area was once filled with markets and shops. Evidence suggests that this was a popular area well into the 6th century.
The Great Temple Complex represents one of the major archaeological and architectural components of Central Petra. Estimated to cover an area of 7,000 square meters, the Great Temple is 28 meters wide and 40 meters long. The style and quality of the temple's elaborate floral friezes and limestone capitals suggest that the sanctuary was constructed around the end of the first century BC by the Nabatians, who combined their native traditions with the classical spirit. The Great Temple was in use until some point in the late Byzantine period. As its name indicates, the structure is generally assumed to be a temple. If so, it was probably dedicated to the principal deity of Petra, Dushara. Often associated with Zeus, Dushara, like the other Nabatian deities, was not represented graphically, but only symbolically. Evidence from excavations reveals the Hellenistic influences visible on various monuments. The Great Temple accommodates a theater in its center, suggesting that the temple may have had a civic as well as a religious function. An earthquake in 363 AD caused the temple's collapse. The complex consists of a lower temenos, accessed by steep staircases, and an upper temenos that contains the temple proper. A temenos, a concept frequently found in early Mediterranean religions, is a piece of land cut off and assigned as an official domain, especially to kings and chiefs, or a piece of land marked off from common uses and dedicated to a god, a sanctuary, holy grove, or holy precinct. The Blue Chapel is situated between the Petra Church and Ridge Church, and is named after the four Turkish blue granite columns that were moved to Petra in the Nabatian era. Sometime in the 5th or 6th century AD, when the monument was converted to accommodate a residence and chapel for the Bishop of Petra, the columns with their bases and Nabatian capitals were moved to their present location. The Petra Church is a Byzantine church located a few hundred meters off the colonnaded street near the Temple of the Winged Lions. Built in the late 4th century AD, the Ridge Church is one of the earliest churches in Jordan. It was built on the north side of the city center with a 360 degree view of the central city. The Petra Church is currently being excavated and preserved. A protective tent covers the roofless walls. It is a three-aisled basilica, about 26 meters by 15 meters, with three apses on the east end and three west portals. The materials used to construct the church, including the capitals, door jams, and reliefs, must have come from the ruined monuments of the Nabatian and Roman periods. Each of the side aisles of Petra Church is paved with 70 square meters of remarkably preserved mosaics, whose subjects include a variety of animals, local, exotic, and mythological, and personifications of seasons, oceans, earth, and wisdom. Also surviving are significant remains of the nave's pavement, with marble and stone geometric designs. Petra boasts an amazing number of churches. Many old tombs were turned into churches or cathedrals, and many tombs later had crosses inscribed into their walls. Along with this, there are three churches built almost side by side. The Christian era at Petra came during the 3rd and 4th centuries, by which point many of the Nabatian people had emigrated elsewhere. After the Islamic conquest of 629 to 632, Christianity and Petra, as in most of Arabia, gave way to Islam. 
During the First Crusade, Petra was occupied by Baldwin I of the Kingdom of Jerusalem and formed the second fief of the barony of al Karak, in the lordship of Outre-Jordan, with the title of Château de la Vallée de Moise, or Sela. It remained in the hands of the Franks until 1189. It is still a titular see of the Catholic Church. The Temple of the Winged Lions is a complex of related facilities, including a worship center, residential quarters, and workshops, a combination never before seen in Abation religious installations. Following the recovery of materials such as the Eye Idol and feline decorated capitals, the temple is believed to have been dedicated to the goddess Alat, one of the three major pre Islamic female deities. Alat is sometimes identified with the Greek goddess Aphrodite, though more often with Athena and Minerva. Her name also appears in the Quran. Marking the end of the colonnaded street, the Temenos Gate was probably constructed during the reign of the Emperor Trajan in the 2nd century AD as a ceremonial entrance to the sacred precinct of Qasr al-Bint Temple. This triple arched gate with large wooden doors also served to separate the sacred precinct from the busy colonnaded street and its shops. The Temenos Gate is an example of the blending of different cultures. Standard Greco-Roman design is evident, as is the geometric motifs of Nabatian architecture. Khazar al-Bint, the main Nabatian temple of ancient Petra, is the only stone-built structure to have survived the area's frequent earthquakes almost intact. Khazar al-Bint was built upon a raised podium with monumental walls that were covered with marble and painted stucco. The masonry, craftsmanship, and ergonomics of its construction indicate that Khazar al-Bint was a very costly project. Opposite the theater, Carved into the foot of the al Kupta mountain are the so-called royal tombs. The royal tombs are five tombs known as royal because they are generally thought to be the burial place of Nabatian kings and dignitaries. Visitors to Petra will be approached by local people selling all kinds of goods, including little children selling beautiful multicolored rocks, women with beaded necklaces, and the ubiquitous ancient coins. The coins are relics of dubious authenticity from Petra's past as a mint, where coins were produced. Another royal tomb is a silk tomb, remarkable for its extraordinary and brilliant coloring. The tomb displays an Assyrian crow-step facade and architectural features common in Abisha and Petra. Scholars have suggested that wealthy Nabatians were mostly buried in five Nabatian burial cities, including three cities in the Sinai Negev, one in the Inner Kingdom, Petra, and one in Saudi Arabia. The Nabatian dead were thus transported to these cities for proper burial. Like other ancient civilizations in the Middle East, such as the Persian and Hebrew, 
the Nabatians were thought to have exposed their dead in high places, so that their bodies could be picked clean by vultures. Only then would they be buried. The next large monument is the so-called Corinthian tomb, one of the most sadly eroded facades in Petra. Its name comes from Léon de Laborde on his visit in 1828, who deemed its columns and capitals to be of the Corinthian order. Tentatively identified as the tomb of Eretus IV, which would date it to the first century AD, it represents an intermediary phase between the ornate decoration of the Casne and the stark simplicity of Aldeir. Resembling a Roman palace, the palace tomb has one of the largest facades in Petra, measuring 49 meters wide. It was the most ambitious of the royal tombs. When the builders ran out of the rock to carve, they built the top of the facade. The ground floor design of the palace tomb does not correspond to the design of the two stories above it, and most of the top story had to be built in masonry rather than carved out of the sandstone, as with the rest of the building although much of the masonry since collapsed, making it impossible to know its original height. Hellenistic and Roman architectural features suggest that the palace tomb may have been the tomb of Petra's last king, Rabel II, before the Nabatians accepted Roman domination in 106 AD. The final small tomb of Sextius Florentinus can be dated to between 126 and 130 AD by a Latin inscription over the doorway, stating that the tomb was constructed for Sextius, Roman governor of the province of Arabia, by his son upon his father's special request. The tomb of Sextius Florentinus combines Nabatian and Hellenistic architectural elements. The inhabitants of Petra supported themselves by agriculture and raising livestock. They built terraces, the walls of which are still to be found in what is now desert, in order to cultivate vines and olive trees. They also bred camels, sheep, goats and horses. Climate and conditions including rainfall did not differ significantly from today, but the Nabatians were extremely skilled in water management storing this precious resource in great rock-cut cisterns, or channeling the plentiful natural supply from its source, Uyan Moza, Moza Springs, some kilometers away to the heart of the city. Remains of pipes, channels, and cisterns can still be seen throughout Petra. Although not as dry as at present, the area occupied the Nabatians was still a desert and required special systems for agriculture. One system was to contour an area of land into a shallow funnel and to plant a single fruit tree in the middle. Before the rainy season, which could easily consist of only one or two rain events, the area around the tree was broken up. When the rain came, all the water which collected in the funnel would flow down toward the fruit tree and sink into the ground. The ground, which was largely lowest, would seal up when it got wet and retain the water.
At the top of another of the mountains surrounding Petra stands one of the most prodigious of all the facades, Adair, the monastery. Its name, like that of the treasury, is a misnomer, relating to its Christian use in the 4th or 5th centuries, when crosses were incised on the back wall of an alcove in the interior, and on some of the rondelles of the Doric frieze. The design is clearly modeled on the treasury, with its two levels and the circular tholos between a broken pediment. But it is much larger and less elaborately decorated, and its niches contain no statues. In place of the treasury's floral and foliate motifs, the monastery has a simple Doric frieze and plain Nabatian capitals. Aldeir was carved from the mountainside in the mid-first century AD and was an extremely important site of pilgrimage. In fact, it is believed, from an inscription nearby, that this monument was a triclinium, possibly used for banquets, in honor of the deified king Obadas I. The monument was also reused during the Byzantine period in the 5th century AD as a church, hence the name Monastery. Little is known of Nemation domestic architecture. In Petra, there were certainly houses carved, like the tombs, into the rock. Excavations have also revealed houses built of limestone blocks, with roofs made of stone slabs supported by arches. Petra lies on the slope of Mount Hor in a basin among the mountains, which form the eastern flank of Araba, the valley of the Wadi Araba that runs from the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba. It is about 250 kilometers from Amman, the capital of Jordan. Around the Deir Plateau, there are many spectacular views of deep gorges and the Wadi Araba. Roman historian Pliny the Elder identified Petra as the capital of the Nabatians, Aramaic-speaking Semites, and the center of their caravan trade. Enclosed by towering rocks and watered by a perennial stream, Petra not only possessed the advantages of a fortress, but controlled the main commercial routes which passed through it to Gaza in the west, to Basra and Damascus in the north, to Aqaba and other spots in the Red Sea, and across the desert to the Persian Gulf. Excavations have demonstrated that it was the ability of the Debatians to control the water supply that led to the rise of the desert city, creating an artificial oasis. The phenomenal Nabatian city of Petra was half built and half carved into the rock, at the interior of a circle of mountains which is riddled with corridors and gorges. One of the world's most famous archaeological sites, where ancient Eastern traditions blend with Hellenistic architecture, Petra was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1985.